From the north side of the San Francisco Bay to Singapore, welcome to Urban X Real Talk Fitness Radio with your host, business owner, lecturer, author, master trainer, Tiaja, with over 30 years of experience in the health and fitness industry. He will challenge the fitness between your ears. So prepare your mind, body, and soul for the revolution of self-care, the evolution of fit, with real talk about real people, real health, real fitness, and the real deal behind our present illness culture. Real talk every time, all the time. Get weekly insights on how to shift your thinking, emoting, eating, training, hydrating, goal setting, and resting for you, the everyday athlete. You can cheat your fitness, but you can't steal your health flow. It's Tuesday, 9 a.m. Let's flow. Welcome to Urban X Real Talk Fitness Radio, where we challenge the fitness between your ears. I'm your host, Tiaja. You know, the so-called experts tell us that one in three people will contract cancer in their lifetimes, that one in four will die from complications attributable to cancer. But do you believe that? And if so, do you believe that you're going to be counted in the one in three or, God forbid, the one in four? See, I read recently where this year a particularly dangerous strand of the flu may affect millions and kill millions more. But do you believe that? Do you believe there's such a thing as a flu season? And if so, why? See, my calendar only recognizes four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. So where did this fifth season called flu season come from? If everything science says becomes like the playground game Simon says, then you and I are doomed. Science says you're going to get sick, so you get sick. See, I believe in science, but not everything science says. I haven't had colds, flus, headaches, or even a stomach illness for decades. So do I now have to knock on wood before some physical calamity may befall me because I spoke those words out loud? Let me ask you, when it comes to your health, do you believe in science or superstition? Sadly, much of what we believe regarding our health is superstition. We'd rather believe we can lose weight by exercising five minutes a day rather than use five minutes to do a serious analysis of our lives. In fact, let's do that now. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I want you to answer them honestly. Ready? Okay. When was the last time you were happy? When was the last time you felt safe? When was the last time you looked in the mirror and liked the person you saw staring back at you? When was the last time you liked or loved your body? When was the last time your life had meaning? When was the last time you were healthy? But Tiaja, what does this have to do with health? Well, over the years, I've had clients perform my workouts and follow my menus with little or no success. They lost weight and they changed initially, but then nothing happened. They were stuck, at least that's what they thought. So they would come to me demanding a new routine or menu plan and I wouldn't give them one. You know why? Because it wasn't about their effort or lack thereof, nor was it about them following the menu to the letter. They were stuck because there were things in their lives, perhaps in their past, they wouldn't let go of. And it was those things, most of them emotional, that kept them either stuck, sick, or not progressing. See, believe it or not, how you feel or think about yourself can and does have a profound impact on your overall health. Should you believe everything you think? Well, take a listen to a TED Talk speech that is actually a call to action. See, we spend about 80% of our day at work. The rest is at home. If we have a bad day at work, we are likely to take that negativity home with us and vice versa. It is of a paramount importance then that we create healthy environments in the spaces that most affect our lives by giving our best and receiving the like in return. I want you to take a listen to author, trainer, Louise Evans, an international leadership developer, a cross-cultural transitional coach, and personal development programmer for individuals and teams working in the international context. She's the author of Five Chairs, Five Choices. Which will you choose? Today will be just another day unless today you decide that it won't be. It is Tuesday, September 24th, 2019. Let's flow. I'd like to introduce you to these five chairs because they are actually the real protagonists of my talk. And they have a special message to give to all of us. And the message is about what behaviors and attitudes we bring into the world in every moment. Now, to show you what I mean, I have a story to tell you from my personal life. And I was trying to build a stronger relationship with a very important person, the daughter of my partner, 20-year-old daughter. 
And to do that, I thought, let's have a great evening out, just the two girls together. And I chose a, a special venue, the Blue Note Jazz Club in Milan. And that, note, that, that night, the Manhattan Transfer, which is my favorite jazz group, were playing. So we meet, atmosphere is fantastic, we're getting on very well, and I'm happy, and uh, being a baby, baby boomer, loving the music, and I thought, well, is she liking it as much as I am? And so in that moment, I just turned to look at her to check. And what did I see? I saw this. She was on her iPhone. Now, how to react? I had some choices. First choice. Excuse me, I mean, what is she doing? She's on her iPhone. I mean, I spent all this time and money thinking of a fantastic evening. I bring her here, and what, after two minutes, I take my eyes off her and she's on her phone? I mean, what is wrong with this generation? I mean, they've got an attention span of a fruit fly. For heaven's sake. God. <sighs> Choice number two. This was a mistake. Why did I bring her here? I mean, she's bored. She's not interested. She doesn't like the music. What was I thinking? I mean, why should she like the music? I mean, this is stuff for baby boomers. She probably thinks she's spending the evening with a dinosaur. Oh, God. Choice number three. Hold your horses. Count to ten. Take a deep breath. Don't jump to conclusions. You don't know what she's doing on her iPhone, so just relax. Take it easy. Have another drink. <laughs> Choice number four. Now, you know what's really important for me is that that evening, this evening together with her, is, is special, that she feels that after this evening she can really open up to me, she can feel safe with me, and that She's, I'm always an open door for her. That's what's really important for me. And I just hope it's going to happen. I just hope. Choice number five. What's important for her? What's going on in her world right now? What's important for her? I really would love to connect to her. And what do I need to do that? You know, I was having real problems trying to answer that question. And in that moment, she turned to me and she said, Louise, did you know that this is the only blue note in the whole of Europe? And there's one in New York and then there's two in Japan, but this is the only one here in Milan. That's incredible. The Italians have got it. And she said, um, oh, and I looked up the Manhattan Transfer. Do you know that they've been playing and singing together for 40 years? That's incredible. Um, oh, and she said, oh, also, look. She handed me her iPhone. She sent a message out on Facebook. It said, in the blue note in Milan, with the Manhattan Transfer and Louise, the best. Now, I, well, that was a close shave. I mean, I could have really spoiled that because I could have sent her a disapproving look from this chair. And she could have started telling herself about me, things about me, like, hmm, Louise, she's controlling. She's difficult. It's not easy to be around her. And that was not my intention at all. And in fact, she was completely engaged. She was there multitasking in her digital way, but she was enhancing our reality. So in milliseconds, I could have destroyed that beautiful moment that we were creating together. And this is what we're doing all the time, is we're making choices about the behaviors that we bring into the world. And the choices that we make have a direct impact on the conversations that we have, the relationships that we form, and the quality of our lives in general. So what can we do at a practical level 
to help us be more conscious about this, because we don't get trained in this at school. It's not on the school curriculum how to behave well, really. So what can we do? Now, the idea of the five chairs came to me when I went and attended a nine-day course in nonviolent communication with its late founder, Marshall Rosenberg, an extraordinary man who did so much for world peace. And after that, it sort of changed my life. After that, I decided that it was a message that I needed to get into our workplaces. Workplaces where I spend most of my time being a coach, a facilitator, and a training trainer. And, and also where we produce some of our most questionable behaviors, sometimes toxic behaviors. So the idea of the five chairs is to help us slow down how we are behaving in every moment of our lives and to analyze what's going on. So what I would like to do is look at the chairs more closely and explain them. The red chair. So this is the jackal chair. I mean, I d jackals are incredibly clever, incredibly um, opportunistic animals. They're always on the lookout to attack. And um, in fact, this chair here is the chair where we misbehave the most. In this chair, we love to blame, to complain, to punish, to gossip. But our supreme game in this chair is to judge. And if you don't believe me, I invite you to go on a mental diet. I invite you to spend one hour with some human beings and see if you can do it without one single judgment going through your mind. I mean, you watch ourselves. Somebody walks in the door. We go, bzzz, I like, don't like, not really interested. And we don't know anything about them at all. So this chair here is a judging chair. There's, there's actually another game that I love in this chair. Is It's the I'm right game. And I used to do that all the time, all the time, until my brother gave me some feedback. I used to do it with my mother because my mother likes to exaggerate. So she would say something like, ah, yes, there were 30 people at the family gathering. And my job was to correct her. And I would say, no, Ma, there weren't 30, there were 13. So I was the policewoman of the situation. My brother touched me on the arm and he said, it doesn't matter. To which I reacted, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Of course it matters, she's wrong and she needs to be corrected for her own good. He touched me on the arm again and he said, do you want to be in a relationship with your mother, or do you, do you want to be right? Ooh. Big lesson. From then on, I always looked upon my mother's exaggeration as a form of abundance. So, here, in this chair, what we tend to do is we, we tend to see what is wrong with other people rather than what is right. And Mother Teresa reminds us, the more we judge people, the less time we have to love them. The next chair is the hedgehog chair, the yellow chair. Now, the hedgehog, when we behave like hedgehogs, we feel very vulnerable and we curl up and we protect ourselves against what we feel is an evil world. And what we do is we mercilessly judge ourselves in this chair. So we turn this chair, the red chair, on ourselves. And we say things like, I'm not intelligent enough. I can't do this. Nobody believes in me. And we have certain fears. We have fears of being rejected, fears of, fears of disappointing, fears of failing. And we also play the victim, so it's, nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. But, and in fact, when I, wait, when I use this in companies and I ask managers, and I say, where do you spend the most, most of your time? Hardly anybody comes and sits here because it's quite difficult to admit to our weaknesses sometimes. We need a lot of courage. And yet we all suffer from self-doubt. But it's really, what do we do with our self-doubt? Do we give up and give in? Or do we say, no, 
I want to find the resources and grow. And Krishnamurti says something wonderful. He says, the highest form of intelligence is the ability to observe ourselves without judging. So, next chair. This is the meerkat chair. I don't know if you've ever seen a meerkat. There are not many in Italy, but um, they are incredible. When they are on, are on sentinel duty, they can stay for one hour, just like this. One hour moving their head, and only their head. Incredibly vigilant. And when we are in this chair, this is what we do. We're mindful, we're very aware, we're observant, we stop, we pause, we take a deep breath, and we're conscious. This is the weight chair, W-A-I-T. What am I thinking? What am I telling myself? So here we become very curious. So if somebody's angry, instead of saying, oh, for God's sake, grow up, will you? We think, hmm, I wonder why that person's angry. And we feel interested. So this chair here is, when I think of Nietzsche, this is such an important quote for this chair. He says, you have your way, I have my way. As for the right way and the only way, it does not exist. So here we have a choice. The red pill or the blue pill. It's the sliding door chair. And in this moment, when we make the right choice, we move into successful, list, uh, successful living. Next chair. Here we go into the world of detect. Now, why detect? Detect because we become detective of ourselves, like Sherlock Holmes of ourselves. We take a magnifying glass and we look at our behaviors. It's a beautiful chair, this, because we become self-aware. We know who we are, we know what we want, we know where we're going. We're not afraid to speak our truth, but we also create our boundaries. We look after ourselves in this chair, but we're very, very powerful. We don't give our power away. Here we give our power away. So here we grow, we become free, we come into our full power, and we become assertive, but not aggressive. So Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom, and we can be here for our whole lives. Why the dolphin? The dolphin, because it's such a wonderful animal, it's playful, it's intelligent, it communicates beautifully. And when I think of the dolphin, I think of us at our very best as human beings. So, next chair. This is the giraffe chair. Very beautiful chair, very difficult. I don't know if you know, but the giraffe has the biggest heart of all land animals. It's that size. And not only does it have the biggest heart, it also has the longest neck. So it has incredible vision. And so when we are in this chair, we are displaying empathy and compassion and understanding. And in this chair, we put our egos on the back burner. And we listen to people. We hold people in our presence. And we care for them. And stepping into somebody else's shoes and understanding them is a great act of generosity. Abraham Lincoln once said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him. And so in this chair, it's an invitation to look at other perspectives, to embrace other realities, to embrace diversity, and to become tolerant. And the most important question in this chair is, what is important for him or her in front of me? And the intention in this chair is to stay connected whatever happens. So, these are the chairs. Now, how do we translate this into daily life? Well, you can imagine, if you go to work, maybe you can go and you give a presentation, 
and it goes really well. So you're here. You think, great, fantastic. Then maybe you have a meeting and things go badly and we sink into these chairs. Now, our challenge every day is to understand how to find a balance between sitting here and sitting here. Because if we're sitting here, life is not that happy. But if we're sitting here in these chairs, we're more rational, we're more open, we're more intelligent, we're more thoughtful. So, something that really moved me very, very deeply when I first read it was this. Viktor Frankl, in his book, in Man's Search for Meaning, said, everything can be taken from man but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose our attitude in any given set of circumstances. This is so powerful. So when you next want to snap at your children or argue with your partner or punish someone at work, try and come into this chair here and think. And if by chance you end up in this chair, which very often happens, can we find the courage to say, I'm sorry, and make everything right again. So, my invitation to you is to take these chairs home with you. Play with them. Make them your own. Teach them to your kids. They get this immediately. Put five of them in the boardroom at work and watch how your meetings will improve. And the next time somebody presses one of your red buttons, just Think, five chairs, five choices. Can we all commit to making our homes, our workplaces, and this world a better place? One behavior at a time. Thank you. Now here are my two cents to feel free to keep the change. What we think about ourselves and others has a direct impact on our health. One of the major problems with the existing medical model is the fact it's based on the endless search for a cure, but never considers the cause. And it is the cause that is at the center of every disease. Yet most would rather look at others and even come up with excuses for why they have contracted some disease or illness. Look, we live in a polluted world, so the chances for you and I to become ill is likely greater than the opposite being true. But what I want you to get is that sickness or illness isn't normal. It is the body's way of telling you or I something is imbalanced. The reason I know this is true is because you would be sick all the time otherwise. And by the way, you can't get sick. Only your body can, and you are not your body. The medical community is just beginning to embrace this understanding of the human body, that the whole is indeed greater than the sum of its parts. Which is to say, Western medicine is finally on the cusp of a real medical breakthrough. And that is, the whole person must be addressed, not just the body. Your thoughts, your emotions, and your perceptions play just as great a role in your health as any fitness routine or menu can. Dear friends, I wish above all things that you prosper just as your soul prospers. You have been listening to Urban X Real Talk Fitness Radio with your host, Tiaja. Until next week, as always, walk in health and peace.